Loads of languages use accent marks. A flick here, a squiggle there, a dot or maybe two. Each one helping to make that language easier to read. But why doesn't English have them? Well, you know what? English should. And I've come up with a way that we can use them. Inspired by languages near and far, I hereby present to you accents for English. By the way, it's unbelievably cold out here, so stick around to see how far I get before my camera dies. Okay, anyone who's grappled with English spelling will know the problems I'm trying to solve here. If you've learned to read English as a second language, respects to you. Because people learning to do so tend to lament the same litany of literal illogicalities. They say, what's with all the silent letters? Why aren't these vowels pronounced the same? How am I supposed to know which part of the word to emphasise? And how do I tell apart two words that look identical? Well, with my new regime of accent marks, I plan to put an end to all this confusion. The aim here is to fix English without the need for spelling reform. So no adding or removing letters, no new characters. See what you make of it and let me know in the comments. Let's begin by tackling one of the most bizarre quirks of English, our excess of silent letters. I mean, they're everywhere. Some because we've just got out of the habit of saying them, others because they're a bit hard to pronounce, and others still that have been intentionally put there by show-off scholars just wanting to demonstrate their knowledge of Latin. But how on earth is someone new to the language supposed to know when a letter isn't meant to be pronounced? Like the B in plumber or the L in salmon. There doesn't appear to be any logic at all. Well, this is where an accent, or as they're technically known, a diacritical mark could come in handy. I've searched through other languages that use the Latin alphabet to see how they've approached this problem. And basically, almost none of them have needed to. English is infected with a uniquely violent strain of silent letteritis. But I did find a little something in Turkish that I think can help us out. Turkish has this letter, which is pronounced G. But it also has this letter, which is pronounced it's silent. Now, this letter isn't as pointless as, say, the B in doubt, because it does affect the word. It changes the sound of the vowel before it. But effectively, what differentiates Turkish's G from its silent equivalent is this little fellow on top. This itty bitty bow is called a breve, a word which literally means brief. And I think it makes for the perfect adornment for our silent letters in English. I propose we use it above silent consonants wherever they may appear. So not the ones that are part of letter combinations, but ones that seem completely pointless, like in island or in dight, in honour or in night. Welcome to the English language, the brie. After all, a sound can't get any briefer than never starting in the first place. So that's going to go a long way to making confusing consonants a bit clear, but really, English's biggest problem is with its vowels. The Roman alphabet simply doesn't have enough of them. Spoken English has around 20 vowel sounds. The exact number depends on your accent. But our alphabet only has these five vowels. Plus Y when it feels... Ah. Oh dear. So it turned out that my microphone succumbed to the cold before my camera did. Something I only discovered after spending another half an hour freezing my um, fingers off. So I hope you'll excuse me if I do the rest of this video from the warmth of my apartment. Now where was I? Ah yes, the Roman alphabet being rubbish. So, like I said, English has around 20 vowel sounds, but the Roman alphabet only has five vowels, or six if you include Y, because it sometimes is one, and I suppose seven if you're a fan of borrowed Welsh words and you want to include W. But even if we're charitable and say that there are seven, not one of them represents the most common vowel sound, indeed the most common sound in English. I'm talking about the rather unenthusiastic sounding uh. Now that sounds known as a schwa, and it's basically our default 
vowel sound. It is everywhere. Take the sentence, my brother has a purple pencil. It's there, 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 and there, being represented by A, E, I, O, and U. So how on earth is the unacquainted reader supposed to know when a letter is meant to be pronounced as a schwa? Well, that is where our next mark comes in. Albanian and the Slavic language of Kashubian both use this character to represent that a uh sound. And I think we can do something similar. Now, I don't think that we should take both of those dots because we're already doing something with two dots in English. If you're confused, don't worry, I will explain later. Instead, let's just take one of the dots. But English is most common sound, I think it's important that we keep things as simple as possible. And what could be simpler than just a dot? And from now on, I say we should use the overdots to signify when a vowel should sound like a schwa. Like this. Admittedly, for some accents, this could get a little out of hand, particularly for people who speak like this. Okay, nobody speaks like that, but the point I'm making is that some accents use the schwa a lot more than others. But I'm confident we can find a sensible standard covering words that are not accent dependent. Now, our work here is by no means done. I think we can do more to make it easier to understand English's exhaustingly inconsistent vowels. And I think we can do it with help from Macron. Moi? No, not you, monsieur. Pardon. I mean, the little line that you can see here. To find this solution, I haven't actually travelled to another part of the world, but instead I travelled back in time, because this solution is inspired by Old English. Now, admittedly, uh, the Macron wasn't used by the Anglo-Saxons who were actually speaking Old English, but it does appear in modern transcriptions of Old English as a way of indicating to the reader when a vowel sound should be long rather than short. Something very similar is done when writing out uh, Latin, classical Latin or you know, ancient Greek and also with Sanskrit too. So I propose we use the Macron in modern English to help us differentiate between short and long vowels as well. We can have cost and most, hint and hind, flange and change. We can even have look and loop if we're feeling saucy. But can you see how that's helpful? And before you ask, the Macrons won't be confused with the breves because we're only using the breves on consonants and the macrons on vowels. See, I'm not stupid. So please give a warm welcome to Macron. Excusez moi. No, still not you. Although, don't some Americans call you Macron? Now, more accents inspired by foreign languages still to come. But isn't it fascinating to see how other languages handle this stuff? You know, my whole interest in English came as a result of learning. French and German, because it meant that I looked at English with new eyes. And that's one of the many reasons why I would recommend that everybody learns at least one foreign language. And allow me to also recommend to you Babbel, who've sponsored this video. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world. I've been using it to learn Spanish, idea? because the idea of being able to speak to another 500 million people across the globe appeals to me enormously. Plus, I have some Spanish friends who I would love to be able to surprise. Podemos hacer algo. Podemos hacer algo. Babbel's great because it has such a wide array of teaching resources, like live teaching sessions, podcasts, games, and of course, lessons you can do wherever and whenever you want. Incluso en el baño. Babbel teaches you using real-world conversations, and I found myself making quick progress because you're right away learning sentences that you can actually use. Spanish is one of my projects for this year. Why not make learning a language one of yours too? Use my link in the description and get 60% off your Babbel subscription. What are we waiting for? Vamos! Now for our next English fix, I'm taking my inspiration from beautiful, beautiful Spanish. Specifically, this marvellous little marker that appears above some Spanish words. It's called an acute accent, and it makes reading Spanish so much easier. 
One of the most magnificent things about Espanol is that syllable emphasis, also known as stress, is extremely consistent. Basically, you almost always stress the second to last syllable of a word. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's more or less it. And when a word breaks that rule, and you are in fact supposed to stress a different syllable, written Spanish gives you a little heads up. It adds that little acute accent above the bit that you're actually meant to emphasize. Now, I think we should learn from this because in English, knowing which syllable to emphasize or emphasize or emphasize can be a bit of a nightmare. So, I propose we have our own marker for stress. However, I don't want to start using the acute accent. For a start, it already appears in some English words, particularly those that we've borrowed from French. But also, we don't want the space above our words to get too cluttered, so we can't put all of our new accents up there. Instead, on this occasion, I'm going to call back our old friend Macron. No, still not you, Sorry. this one again. But instead of having it above a letter, we're going to stick it below. I mean, this just makes sense, right? We already underline things to emphasize them. That's also traditionally the method used by proofreaders to tell the printer to put something in italics to emphasize it. So sticking a line under a syllable to show that it's stressed just seems sort of intuitive. But let's not put it under the entire syllable. We can take a leaf out of Spanish's book and we'll just focus on the relevant vowel. By the way, it can be a little difficult to find a way to type one of these. So let's just say you can just underline it or underscore it too. As long as there is a line down there, I think we're all good. Let's be sparing with it, but I think this one can really come in handy. For example, the words channel and canal have exactly the same etymological root. They're both from the same old French word, but there's a barely explicable difference in emphasis between them. So let's help readers out by pointing out that one is pronounced channel and the other one is pronounced canal. Actually, that's not the best example because in English, a schwa is never stressed. And helpfully, we've already pointed out where the schwas are in these words. But you do get what I mean, right? No need to emphasize my point any further. That was a pun. Now, another common complaint about English that we need to resolve is that we have a lot of words that are spelt the same as one another, but mean different things. Sometimes they're not just spelt the same, but they're pronounced the same too. These are called homographs from the Greek for written the same. These, of course, do exist in other languages, but some languages have clever ways of avoiding any ambiguity. For example, in both French and Italian, one of the words for the is la. But also in both languages, there is a word spelt la and pronounced la that means there. That's a recipe for confusion, surely. But no one ever gets muddled up because both languages have very handily popped a little accent on the latter la so that you can tell the two apart. French has also done the same with ou meaning or and ou meaning where as well. That diacritic is called a grave and we should start using it too. That way we'll know the difference between mean as in nasty and mean as in average and present as in gift and present as in here. And while we're at it, what's to stop us doing the same for words that are spelt the same, but are pronounced differently? After all, they still look identical on the page, don't they? Let's take inspiration from Dutch, for example, which uses accents to differentiate between its words an and ain, both of which I'm sure I've pronounced very badly, but which otherwise would be identically written. So I say we do the same with our words bow and bow minute and minute. I genuinely once embarrassingly ordered a minute steak. Close and close, wind and wind, wound and wound. Now what I've tried to do with these is put the accent over the ones that seem to me just like they have a more prominent vowel sound, but we can have a conversation about whether that's appropriate. I'm open to alternative suggestions. I think the logic used in French is that the accent goes on the one that's used the least often. If you've got specific thoughts on that, by all means, pop them in the comments below. And at this point, I think we should just stop to drink in what we've already achieved here. Let's do that by looking at a word I've already mentioned, this one. Or rather, 
these four. Because these are all different words, but under our current writing regime, it is impossible to tell what any of them mean. However, allow me to show you how the accents that we've so far discussed magically make all of that uncertainty disappear. First of all, let me add them. There they are. Now let's talk through them. So the first one is present, a gift. The dot over the second E tells you that it's that uh sound, it's present. The second one is also present, but this time meaning, you know, now. And we can tell it apart from the other present because we've popped that grave accent on top. The third one is present, like to present a prize with the emphasis on the second syllable. I could have also put a schwa dot on the first E, but not everyone pronounces it that way. And finally, what is that last one? What do you think? Okay, it's a bit of a cheeky one. So this one is actually present, which you might otherwise write like that, I suppose, but look how I've saved some space. The macron on the first E tells you that it's a long E sound, and we don't need to put anything else because we're giving equal weight to both syllables. So we get present. So there we go. Four words that once looked the same are now easily told apart. Okay, I'm still not done, but time for a change of tack. This time I don't want to propose anything new. Instead, I want to advocate for the expansion of something that we already do. Let's talk about diuresis. No, it's not a kidney treatment nor a bowel complaint. It is the name for those two dots you find, for example, above the I in naive. This often gets confused with the two dots you find in a lot of German words, the umlaut, but actually it's different. An umlaut serves to change the sound of the vowel it's positioned over, but diuresis serves another purpose. It tells you that when two vowels are positioned next to each other, you sound each of them out rather than merge them into a single vowel sound. It's what makes this naive rather than naive or naive. French uses diuresis much more than we do. Their word for canoe is canoe, their word for maize is maïs, and you find it in French names like zoe or gaël or maël. In English you generally only find it in words of French origin like naïve or noël. However, there is one place in the English-speaking world where you will see it used more widely, and that is in the pages of The New Yorker. Almost since the magazine's inception, they have stubbornly stuck to the style point of instead of writing cooperate, just like that, or with a hyphen, they should spell it like that, to avoid anyone getting accidentally cooped up, I suppose. They use it in words like re-elect too, so that no one is unwittingly left reeling. I like this. It looks better than the hyphen, which let's face it is a bit of a bodge job anyway. We don't normally separate prefixes from the rest of the word. We don't write it prefixes, do we? Now the New Yorker does say that its use of diuresis is one of its biggest sources of reader complaints, but I think it's elegant. Even the eyes of seasoned English speakers might need a second look at a word like re-enter. Let's at least give non-native speakers a chance. I also think the word diuresis could benefit from having a diuresis too. So I say let's cooped it further. Sorry, co-opt it further. Now just before we bask in the full glory of what we've achieved here, I want to give an honourable mention to a couple of symbols that did not make the cut this time anyway. Firstly, Let's talk about tilde and the absolute blinder that it's playing in the Spanish letter ñ. Did you know this originally started out life as an extra n on top? It was used as a way of abbreviating a double n. So maybe we should consider a similar idea for cleaning up double letters in English. Or as I have advocated in the past, we could just take ñ wholesale and use it in words like union, onion or companion. We've just got to find a way of working this one in, I think. And I also want to give a shout out to the Caron, which is doing a brilliant job saving space. It's used to turn a C into a CH and an S into a SH. That's perhaps a change we should make too.
But as I said up top when I was still out in the freezing cold... It is unbelievably cold out here. No adding or removing letters was allowed this time. We should just be able to go through an existing text with a red pen and fix it right up. So let's stick with the six that I've already suggested. It's time to bring the present doubt to a close and cooperate for change. Start using these accents today. I hope you've enjoyed this introduction to the world of diacritics disguised as a call for wholesale reform of English orthography. If you did, I think you're going to like this video too, or maybe this one. If you want more juicy language bites from me, do check out my free newsletter and my Patreon. Links below. And um, I'll see you in the next thing. Goodbye.